All right, welcome back everybody to session three. Um, it's been a great day so far. I've enjoyed the morning talking about pharmacotherapy um, and the session just previously uh, talking about the co drug communication. Um, so today's session, um, uh, at session three, we're gonna be talking about treatment and harm reduction. Um, and I'd just like to also note and thank NCRED um, I'm someone with a lived experience on the um, on the working group, um, and yeah, I just really appreciate the dedication to to research that is translated into clinical practice, um, as it's easy to just to see the direct positive uh, outcomes for people like myself that have uh, consumed services. So appreciate that, uh, and appreciate all you dedicated people doing great research. Um, so. Uh, we might just kick it off if everyone is back to um, maybe sneak in a couple of extra little minutes. Um, to start off, um, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Peter Kelly to the stage, who's the Deputy Head of School Research, School of Psychology Director, Centre for Health, Psychological Practice and Research School of Psychology, University of Wollongong, to talk about the B-SMART feasibility, um, preliminary efficacy of an intervention for family members impacted by methamphetamine. Hi everyone, my name is Pete Kelly. I'm from the University of Wollongong. I'm really sorry that I can't, can't be at the conference today. I was really looking forward to it, but got called away for a family family thing. Um, if you've got any questions at the end of my presentation, by all means, should, feel free to shoot me through an email. I'll be really happy to, to answer any questions or, or get any feedback. So my presentation today is on the Smart Recovery Family and Friends Program. We did a feasibility study that was, was funded by, by NCRED. Um, before I get into it too much, just really want to acknowledge we're meeting on Aboriginal land and wanted to welcome any Aboriginal people that might be dialing into the presentation and um, pay respects to um, elders past, present and, and emerging. Also wanted to really thank um, NCRED. Um, we've been fortunate to have received a couple of these NCRED grants and they're so, so important in terms of um, doing research with, with partners on, on the ground. So for this project with, with Smart Recovery, it's really helped to facilitate, I think, an, an interesting program of research, which we're you know, really keen to, to progress and, and, and continue to build on. So thank you so much, NCRED. Likewise, wanted to thank Smart Recovery. Um, we've worked really closely with Smart Recovery on this, on this project. I'm um, in particular, Angela Argent, who delivered all of the, the groups that I'm about to, to talk about. So great partners and I've really appreciated working with Smart Recovery. Um, as with all of these types of studies, there's always just a range of, of people involved. So I wanted just to yeah, highlight the, the research team and, and give a thank you to, to everyone involved. So in terms of the, the background, so I'm presuming it's been covered a, a lot as part of this presentation, but you know, clearly there's a, a range of harms related to, to methamphetamine use in Australia. Um, and I think it's it's I think we're all pretty pretty aware that methamphetamine use is, also has enormous impacts on family members and friends and, and supporters of, of people who might be using methamphetamine. So this study is really focused on examining the feasibility of a specific family and friends program that was developed by Smart Recovery Australia. And we're really interested, I guess, looking at the feasibility of the program more broadly, but likewise looking at um, how useful and, and how, um, I guess, effective it, it might be for people who are impacted by the methamphetamine use of a, of a loved one or a family or, or friend. Smart Recovery, um, a, a number of years ago now, developed the, the Family and, and Friends Program. It was really based on the work of Jim Orford, Richard Vellerman and, and colleagues um, using the, the stress-strain coping model of, of addiction. So the group program um, in, incorporates aspects of, of that theory, but also looks very similar to, to what a smart recovery group would, would look at. So it's very um, strength-based, empowering, 
that really aims to help um, develop practical skills for the you know, individual family members or, or support people. Um, the program isn't necessarily on trying to change the behaviour, the drug use of, of someone else. It's really about trying to support the, the family members and empowering them to, to improve you know, their quality of life and, and overall coping skills. In terms of the design, it's really a feasibility study. So sort of small number of participants that we're recruiting um, and just really looking at you know, how feasible it is to, to be able to deliver these groups in the community. Uh, we used a pre-post design with a, a one month follow-up and our goal was to, to deliver um, five groups across, uh, across different settings in Australia. I should disclaim that COVID-19 had quite a large impact on the study. So originally we wanted to deliver a range of groups um, across, across different Australian states. That obviously wasn't impossible to, to do these face-to-face -face groups. So we ultimately delivered it all, all online, uh, but we're still able to access, or lots of participants were coming from multiple Australian states, which was encouraging. In terms of the results, um, so we just finished our fifth group uh, a couple of weeks ago. So these, these results are, are very, very early. Um, and you know, I suspect if there's future conferences, we could um, give a more thorough uh, presentation of, of the results. Um, but in summary, we were able to recruit 45 people um, to, the, to the study. In terms of advertising, all of the recruitment happened through the Smart Recovery Australia website. Uh, we kind of anticipated that we would need to do sort of some media and maybe some, some paid um, advertising, um, but we, we didn't ever need it. We we're able to do it all through the Smart Recovery website, which is really encouraging in terms of longer term dissemination of, of these types of approaches. And it, it certainly highlighted that there was, a, there was a need. As part of our advertising on the website, we indicated that we were really keen to have people who are impacted by methamphetamine use um, joining the study and joining the groups. Um, we were able to achieve that. So 89% of um, participants in the study were impacted by methamphetamine. Likewise, in terms of the fidelity of, of the intervention, um, we had research assistants who are um, sitting in and watching the, the groups um, and going through checklists and, and there was really high fidelity in the delivery of, of the group. And that was quite pleasing, particularly as we had to switch to online delivery of all of these groups. It really talks to, to Ange from Smart Recovery who was, who was leading all of that. In terms of um, participant engagement, so we had 45 people enroll in the study, um, 44 commence the groups. We had six or so people who didn't really in, engage, so about 13%. They attended two groups or, or less, uh, but the large majority, about 87% of, of people um, re were regularly attending the groups and on average about 6.8 sessions people were attending over the eight sessions that were provided as, as part of the program. In terms of some, uh, this is really kind of early qualitative um, feedback from, from some of the first rounds of, of feedback that we got. What we were seeing with the participant feedback was Kind of what we'd be hoping to to um, be coming through. So participants were reporting the idea that the groups were really helping to develop coping skills, to develop practical strategies that that people you know could use in their their day to day life. And so that included things like you know setting boundaries, um, and you know, in particular sort of compromising and um, being able to work with the person who might be using the substance to you know, develop boundaries that were kind of meeting each other's needs. Um, and also, you know, strategies to, to think about how to, how to resolve conflict. Um, what was nice is um, there were certainly some descriptions of people reporting attitudinal changes. Um, and so some of that was towards the, the substance of dependence or towards their family member. And many cases sort of separating the, the person's drug use from, from, from the person and being able to see, uh, I guess, those, those two different perspectives. Um, a big part of the feedback was around this idea of decreased loneliness and um, you know, decreased social isolation. Um, so I think one of the really big parts of Smart Recovery, but really any mutual support groups is this, this idea of people coming together who are sharing a, a somewhat similar experience and, and, and working together and, and, and bonding. And that was certainly coming through in the feedback. Um, I think this idea that people weren't alone, that, that other people were experiencing similar things and you know, having that connection, I think was, was quite important. 
Um, likewise, people reported on the group format and the content. They talked about the content being quite emotionally challenging, um, so that it, it being quite confronting and people really needing to, I guess, think about their perspective and, and, and where they're at. Um, so, you know, people you'll see in some of the comments here were talking about it as being quite challenging, but they also described that as you know, quite a, a positive aspect of the group that, you know, that, that they were getting something out of it. There was also some positive feedback on the online groups. Um, so people, I think, appreciated just the ease of being able to access the online groups and you know, being able to dial in from really anywhere in Australia to be involved. I'm not necessarily convinced that, that online is, is better than the face-to-face -face groups, but I, I think it has some, some advantages and from the results would, you know, would seem to be quite, quite feasible. So just you know, in conclusion, yeah, the study is you know, certainly demonstrated that it's feasible to recruit and deliver these groups in, in the community, um, and in particular, access people or access family members who are impacted by, by methamphetamine. Um, the feedback that we've got so far and the qualitative um, feedback have, have been really encouraging and kind of support the underlying philosophy of, of the program, but still early days and we, we still need to, to do a lot more analysis. So uh, I, I guess stay tuned for, for papers that, that might be released. Thank you again. My apologies that I'm, I'm not there, but um, yeah, hopefully you found that, that useful and don't hesitate to email me if you've got any questions. Thanks a lot, everyone. Okay, how good's that? Um, Pre-recorded videos, uh, there's nowhere to hide for anyone. You still have to present. Um, so, and as Professor Kelly said, if you have any questions, please email them through. Just a reminder, if you have any questions on the following presentations, please just drop them in the Q&A box. Um, so next up, and I apologize in advance, um, Antonio, my, my, I'm not too exotic with my pronunciation, so I apologize. We have Professor Antonio, Vigero Garcia um, talking about goal management training for people with methamphetamine use disorder and in residential treatment. I'd like to welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. I get, that was really good, actually. All right. So let me share the screen. And if I can just do a quick check that you can see the slides and you can hear me well. Yes, we can. Oh, good. Thank you very much. All right. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to be presenting today on this trial that we're conducting on cognitive remediation for people with methamphetamine use disorder. And um, I want to thank straight away to the two fantastic clinical PhD students, Alex Anderson and Alex Robinson, that are conducting the trial uh, on the spot. And I hope I can do justice to, to the work uh, today. Uh, all right, so first of all, um, I would like to tell you about the, the motivation for, for the trial. And, um, and that is based on, on this uh, conceptualization of addiction uh, in which we, we think that addiction is linked to uh, neurobehavioral alterations in at least four different systems. But actually, when you look into uh, existing treatment options, uh, most of those treatment options uh, try to target two of those systems. So try to target either the incentive salient system, and this is what happens with uh, anti-craving medications or anti-craving interventions, or they try to target the, the negative emotionality system, and, and that is the use that we make of antidepressants in, in addiction. Uh, and also that was the origin of CBT, was a, a therapy uh, for depression. And on the other hand, uh, you have two other components, um, executive functions and decision making that are not uh, directly or specifically targeted uh, by any of the interventions that we have at the moment available for uh, addiction and specifically for methamphetamine use disorder. So if you look into uh, what could be out there in the market for uh, executive dysfunction and decision making, uh, goal management training is kind of the, the gold standard uh, cognitive remediation intervention for executive dysfunction. Um, it was originally developed for people with uh, brain injury, uh, but uh, with time it has been shown that it is uh, efficacious in any population that has um, a relatively good level of general cognitive processing 
uh, but uh, have some problems that are relatively specific to, to executive function and decision making. And we knew that it was promising for use in, in addiction because we had some positive results from pilot trials that we, we had conducted in Europe. But of course, uh, the issue is that the program needed some adaptations to cater for uh, the needs of people with methamphetamine use disorder uh, and also of the treatment settings that usually apply this type of treatment in, in Australia. So that is the, the first thing uh, that we did. Uh, we engaged in a, in a co-design uh, process uh, together with um, consumers, so people with methamphetamine use problems, uh, clinicians that were involved in the treatment of, uh, uh, of these people, and, and also with uh, designers that have expertise in, in health intervention design. And through that process, what we did is we streamlined and repackaged the, the original GMT intervention, and we transformed it into something that uh, is a little bit more focused to the um, uh, cognitive processes that are dysfunctional in people with methamphetamine use disorder. And also a lot of the character examples and a lot of the activities are much more aligned and resonate much more with the experiences of people with methamphetamine use disorder. So uh, based on that, then we carried forward uh, GMT plus to uh, a pilot trial, which is uh, the one that we're conducting with the support of Encred, and we are super happy and, and, and thankful that we have this support. And uh, these are the characteristics of the, of the trial. So it's a four week uh, single blind. So in this case, the assessors are blind to the intervention allocation, uh, cluster randomized crossover. So in this case, what is randomized is the sequence in which the interventions are applied to the treatment site. And we are doing it in collaboration with therapeutic communities. Uh, so our main partner is uh, Odyssey House, but uh, Given the difficulties of recruiting in COVID times, we also branched out and, and got collaboration from Windana and Arrow Health, and we're very grateful for that. And then we have a, an intervention arm, uh, which is using GMT+, Plus, which is this cognitive remediation intervention. And then we have a comparator, which is a psychoeducation intervention that we call Brain Health. And the idea is that the two interventions are matched in terms of the uh, materials and the exposure that they get to the, uh, uh, to the therapies, but they critically differ in terms of the active ingredients. So once it, one, one intervention is cognitive remediation, the other one is purely psychoeducation. And as primary outcomes uh, that we measure at the four-week endpoint, uh, we have uh, tolerability that we're measuring through uh, whether participants withdraw the trial, the trial after consent, uh, and also through a subjective uh, scale of acceptability, and executive functions, uh, which we measure through self-report uh, on the behavioral rating inventory for executive function, the brief. In terms of participants, uh, we were tar targeting something between 32 and 48 participants, so that it would allow us to have between 16 and 24 per arm. Uh, or it is the same to have approximately four groups uh, per each of the arms. And the main criteria were for people to meet uh, DSM-5 criteria for DSM uh, for methamphetamine use disorder, according to the, uh, the mini uh, neuropsychiatric interview, and they had to be enrolled in treatment. And the main exclusion criteria were having a primary diagnosis of psychosis or schizophrenia, uh, or having severe cognitive impairment that we measured with the Montreal screening, uh, or being currently taking benzodiazepines, as we have shown before, that that was quite disruptive for group functioning. And just to give you an overview of what the interventions entail, so GMT Plus um, uh, is composed of two main components. Uh, one of them are the face-to-face -face sessions that we do with the participants. Uh, so we do one uh, weekly session and we do four different sessions. So that's why the program runs for uh, four consecutive weeks. And each of those sessions is devoted to uh, one cognitive process that is critical for uh, the uh, psychopathology of methamphetamine use disorder. Uh, and those sessions are uh, programmed in a progressive way. So essentially what you uh, learn on the first session allow you to build the learning that you can do in the second session and so forth. And um, each of those sessions is dedicated to attention, impulse control, goal setting and decision making. And then in addition to that, we have a journal uh, that is something that uh, the participants take physically with them and they 
uh, uh, they do and practice with it every day. And it is full of uh, engaging activities that resonate much more with the, um, the daily life of um, people, both in treatment and outside treatment. And, uh, and they are supposed to allow repeated practice of a lot of the strategies that we teach during the face-to-face -face, uh, sessions. So that is for GMT and then brain health is just a psychoeducation intervention. And we dedicate again, four, four different sessions, uh, one every week, and each of them is dedicated to one of the pillars of health. Uh, so we have one on cognition and uh, neuroplasticity, another one on physical activity, another one on healthy eating habits, and another one on healthy sleep. And they also have a, a journal that they, uh, they uh, do uh, in terms of daily activities to reflect uh, on some of the health content that we deliver in the sessions. So as you can see, the two interventions are superficially similar and they are much in terms of time and exposure, but uh, uh, they critically differ on the mechanisms that they are trying to train. And here you can see a little bit of a, a flow uh, of how things occur uh, when uh, across the trial. Uh, so we have a first point of contact uh, facilitated by the treatment staff. And based on that, we pre-select uh, some participants that then are screened by our research team. Um, and then we get the randomization of the intervention, whatever it is, GMT plus or brain health, which runs for four weeks. And then we do a number of uh, assessments at post intervention and then a couple of follow-ups four weeks and 12 weeks after the intervention. And uh, just to have a look at the assessments, as you can see, the, the baseline assessment is quite um, intensive. Uh, and that is why we also do um, a thorough cognitive assessment using uh, computerized tasks, in addition to the, to the brief, which is a self-report measure of executive function. Uh, and then you see that the, the key outcome measure is that change between baseline and post-intervention on the brief, uh, which is the uh, measure of executive function. But then we have a number of secondary outcomes, uh, both at the four week and the 12 week follow up uh, that are much more related to drug use characteristics, craving and quality of life. So the kind of standard outcome measures that you would take in, in addiction treatment trials. Uh, in terms of um, uh, interim progress, and, uh, and uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize before because we don't have the, the final results. I hope that we have another opportunity to share those final results. But in terms of interim progress, uh, so far we, we have um, engaged uh, 17 people in GMT plus and 14 people in brain health. And you can see that they are uh, in their mid thirties, like secondary education as an average. And in terms of clinical characteristics, uh, they are daily users of methamphetamine and they have uh, severity of dependence scores that are on the moderate, moderate to severe range. And, and you have a bunch of mental health comorbidities as, as you would expect in, in this population. In terms of the uh, results that we can share at this stage, uh, I guess the, the good news is that no participants have withdrawn after consent. Uh, so that gives us an idea of uh, high acceptability and tolerability of the intervention. Um, and we also, uh, we're also very happy about the retention that we have achieved in the, in the group. So we have over 70% completing three or more sessions of GMT, uh, which I think it's, uh, it's quite remarkable. Uh, in terms of within session engagement, and, and this speaks to the fantastic job that the uh, clinical PhD uh, students, Alex and Alex, are doing, uh, we're measuring this through this group assessment scale that ranges between 0 and 40, and you can see that the uh, engagement within sessions is quite high, both for GMT and control, and that gives us confidence as well that any differences or no differences that we observe uh, are not going to be related to non-specific aspects of the of the therapy, and of course the primary outcomes uh, will be analyzed upon intervention completion. And I think like we are running the last couple of groups, so that will be happening uh, at the end of December this year. So in terms of the conclusions that we can uh, share at this stage, uh, I think like one really important point is that we have demonstrated ourselves at least that both interventions can be ecologically integrated into mainstream treatment services. And this was a, a big ask at the beginning, right? Like whether we were going to be able to integrate in a way that it would look seamless uh, uh, in, in, in the context of the existing intervention that they are undergoing. 
And that is the way that we're thinking at the moment about cognitive remediation is always going to be an adjunct to what is existing. It's not going to be a replacement for anything. Um, then we're getting very positive feedback from uh, the beneficiaries, so for from the uh, people that is engaging in the groups uh, and the intervention. We know that is very well tolerated and, and doesn't have any uh, any side effects. Uh, the other really good thing is that the treatment staff at the treatment center, centers are highly engaged and they're very keen to be trained. Uh, and in fact, we have already programmed a couple of workshops with them as soon as we finish the data collection for the trial in order to be able to train them to deliver the interventions themselves. Uh, so that really speaks to the scalability of this intervention beyond this trial. Um, uh, so that, that's really exciting for us as well. Um, and that's it. I would have loved to have more results today, but uh, but I think like I, I'm going to build a little bit more of anticipation and hopefully like we can get um, the reward soon. So thank you very much for that. I would acknowledge everyone involved, not only Alex and Alex, but also uh, our clinical partners, um, Eric, Carol, uh, Emily at Windana. Uh, they've been doing an amazing job facilitating uh, the conduction of this trial. And of course, NCRID and MRFF for uh, funding different aspects of this study and Mark at Monash. Thank you very much. Oh, by the way, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> uh, amazing. Thanks. Thanks for that presentation. What we might do um, is that we do have um, some questions coming through the Q&A box. I can see the notifications, but we'll just leave it to the end um, and we'll do a bit of a panel like the last session. Um, so thanks for that presentation. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Alison Beck um, talking about methamphetamine and mutual support, a mixed method exploration of smart recovery participants, char characteristics and opportunities for enhanced referral pathways from the University of Wollongong. Thank you very much. So if I can just do a quick uh, check that everyone can hear and see okay. Yes. yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Um, so a couple of quick acknowledgements to begin with. We're incredibly grateful for um, our NPRED funding to be able to conduct this research. Um, and as Pete mentioned before, um, we've got a wonderful partner in Smart Recovery, uh, without whom we wouldn't be able to, to run this research. So big shout out to them and all of their support. So as has been demonstrated throughout many of the presentations today, um, methamphetamine is a, something that is incredibly important to be able to address, um, particularly in terms of um, access to accessible, effective, um, engaging treatments. Um, and so a little bit of background to this particular study, um, we were interested in the potential role of um, mutual support, and I'll come to that in a moment. Um, because some of the key barriers uh, that we know within the literature um, that might get in the way of people being willing to engage with uh, treatment, things around stigma and embarrassment and shame, um, not necessarily noticing that the addictive behaviour is a problem, um, and also being able to access treatment. Um, good news being also, as we've heard today, that when people do engage with treatment, um, positive outcomes are possible. So from our perspective, we really wanted to have a bit of a think about how can we potentially improve engagement um, with treatment and support. So as I mentioned, our interest was in the potential role of mutual support because we were thinking that mutual support, so um, that, that social, the emotional, the informational support, so being able to um, learn from one another, from people who have been there, done that, it's a really incredibly powerful opportunity to be able to access um, information and support. And the other benefit of it is that oftentimes um, it's an anonymous thing. Um, it's also driven by that lived experience. It's not a, it's not a professional um, sort of um, established service, if you like, um, because some of those traditional, rather than established, some of those traditional services sometimes are the ones that are associated with a little bit more of the stigma. Um, and so being able to potentially engage people in um, a mutual support group felt like it might go some way at least to being able to address some of those key barriers for engagement. Um, and so we were interested in Smart Recovery. We've um, partnered with them previously. Um, and it's also um, a program that integrates um, some evidence-based strategies and principles for being able to support people to change.
So we had a range of different um, aims from this particular project. We wanted to understand a little bit more around whether or not smart recoveries are something that people are already attending for methamphetamine. Um, is there any particular similarities and differences between people who attend for methamphetamine or other behaviours? Um, is there anything that we can learn about um, group cohesion? Um, and also more broadly, how does smart recovery and mutual support fit within the broader uh, treatment system? And is there any way that we can actually improve engagement with um, smart recovery and also treatment and support um, more broadly? So we had a number of different um, studies or sub-studies or methods that we used. So we, um, there was a routine data collection that the smart recovery um, facilitators did. Um, and that's the main data that I'll be presenting today. So I'll talk to those methods in a moment. Um, but we also did um, qualitative interviews with participants and we also did a survey, um, again, courtesy of COVID, that was a little bit of a change um, in that we ended up changing the survey to a post online group survey um, because we weren't able to uh, investigate face to face groups, courtesy of all of the changes that have happened over the last little bit. Um, so as I mentioned, this is the sort of core part of the data that I'll be presenting today, and it's a bit of an update to what I had the opportunity to speak about last year. Um, so at the end of um, a group, so this data was collected between um, 2018 and 2020. Um, and so facilitators would enter at the end of the group a kind of snapshot of some of the characteristics of the attendees, um, an anonymous um, aggregate kind of number. Um, and then they also completed this item here, which is entertivity, a um, index of group cohesion. So you'll see the little circles in the middle, that's yourself, um, as in the facilitator, the circles around are the group participants. And the aim is to have a bit of a look at that and say which one, one through six, is the one that best describes the, the vibe or the closeness of, of today's group. So in terms of um, our questions around do people who use methamphetamine attend smart recovery, um, our answer to that is yes. Um, so between uh, 2018 and 2020, um, we were able to analyse data from uh, 3,841 groups, um, over 22,000 attendees. So that's individual occasions of service because we weren't able to identify the individual people. Um, but yeah, 22, over 22,000 individual um, services and 22% um, attending for methamphetamine. And so if we look at the data and sort of break it down according to um, the proportion of um, people within a group who are attending for methamphetamine, um, we've got 13% where more than half of attendees were attending for methamphetamine, 45% um, where it's the um, one to 50, and then 42% where there was no methamphetamine um, related attendees. In terms of a snapshot of some of our participant characteristics, um, the data suggested that for participants who are attending smart recovery for methamphetamine related difficulties, we've got more males um, than females. Um, and advice the opposite was true for um, non-methamphetamine related behaviours. And then when it comes to our age ranges, it was in the 25 up to the 44 age groups there um, that were most likely to be people attending for methamphetamine. Um, in terms of our participant characteristics, these are some of the other things that um, the facilitators entered data on whether or not the participant had come to the group before. So that's the returning or new. Um, so quite a few people that were attending for methamphetamine were quite happy to come back. Slightly slight trend beyond um, uh, other types of behaviours. Um, and then when it comes to the requested proof, this is a bit of a proxy of whether or not um, attendance at the group is um, mandated or, or due to some kind of legal implication. Um, and we've got a high proportion of people, um, both methamphetamine and other behaviours who are attending. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> A large proportion of people did not request proof, um, but yeah, we've still got almost 20% in um, both categories at um, potential legally mandated attendance in smart recovery. And then when we look at group location, um, people attending for methamphetamine were more likely within our rural segments, um, were more likely to attend for methamphetamine and uh, vice versa in Metro for the other behaviours. And this data here is based on the location of the group and the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, postcode uh, definitions. 
And then um, importantly, when it comes to what can we learn about group cohesion, um, going back to that graph where we broke groups down according to whether there was no people attending for methamphetamine, one to 50% of people attending for methamphetamine or more than half the group, um, irrespective, the group cohesion or entitativity score um, was quite high. So zero is the lowest, six is the best. And so across all of those groups, we've got quite high um, ratings of group cohesion. Again, we've got to take it into account that it was a facilitator rated um, uh, questionnaire. So there could potentially be a bit of bias there. However, these findings are quite promising that um, people are in the groups are experiencing high cohesiveness irrespective of the um, group composition. So then when it comes to our work in progress, the other bits and pieces that we're doing as part of this project to be able to answer our questions. Um, we've got a qualitative um, study where we spoke to people about their experiences with treatment and support, um, how they came to engage, um, how it fit relative to when their behaviours of concern started, um, the types of behaviours that they accessed support for, um, and how they came to be involved in smart recovery. Um, and so we're in the process of being able to analyse that data and hopefully we have an opportunity to come back next year and we can present more on that. Um, but people are incredibly generous with their time and their contribution um, to that research. And it was amazing to hear um, people's journeys and I hope that it's something that we can learn from. And then we have um, a survey that we did um, at the end of online groups. As I mentioned, COVID led to a transition of um, smart recovery groups to online. Um, and then there was a survey monkey link at the end of the online group that people could click on um, and rate their experience of the group. So there was a range of questions around um, how welcome they felt, how um, well it was facilitated, whether they came away with um, practical, helpful skills, those kind of things. Um, so we've got over 1,500 respondents across a 12-month, um, actually more than a 12-month period now, um, and of those over 200 or so people um, endorsed methamphetamine as one or more of the behaviours that they were attending for. Um, and so our aim is being able to analyse that data to get a little bit of a sense of um, similarities and differences in how people um, experience the groups, well, at least how they experience the online groups. So based on what we've currently got, um, we've got evidence that people um, who use methamphetamine, they do attend smart recovery. Um, that it seems that the groups are working quite well cohesion-wise, um, irrespective of how many attendees are experiencing difficulties with methamphetamine. Um, and then we've got some of those preliminary characteristics around gender and age and location that might be associated with attendance. So together with all of this data, when we've got the other studies done, we're really hoping that it's something that we can be able to use to um, improve access and engagement um, to smart recovery groups and sort of inform access to, to treatment and support more broadly um, might be about uh, more assertively linking people into treatment and support um, some other kind of creative way depending on what it comes out of um, our analyses. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present today and if you do have any um, questions feel free to reach out. Thanks so much for that. Fantastic. Again, if anyone has any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box and, and we'll answer them at the end of this session. Um, so next up, um, we have Miss Florence Bascom um, talking about feasibility, efficacy of the S-Check app to change help-seeking behaviour of people who use methamphetamine. Take it away. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to um, present. Um, I know this is the last presentation of the day, so thanks for sticking with us. So just start by um, thanking the other investigators and uh, acknowledging um, that we received funding from a New South Wales Health Early Intervention and Innovation Grant. And now I can't figure out how to change my slides. I'd also just like to thank everyone on the advisory group and those who previously worked on the study and of course all of the participants. So there's an increasing demand for treatment of methamphetamine or MA dependence and proportionally for clients seeking treatment from publicly funded specialised alcohol and other drug treatment services, MA now accounts for 28% of all treatment episodes second only to alcohol. This is an increase of 9% in the past 10 years. Whilst treatment episodes are increasing, there is a significant delay to treatment seeking as uh, just briefly discussed in Dr. Beck's presentation and um, a, particularly a perception of 
non-problematic use among people with MA dependence can delay treatment seeking. In a study by Quinn et al, 41% of a sample of people who use MA regularly reported their use was not problematic or harmful enough to warrant professional support. Although these people generally engaged in less risky patterns of MA use, there were indications of significant MA-related problems among some of these people. Similarly, in an evaluation of the St. Vincent's s Check Clinic, more than half of the 43 participants who reported that they didn't have a problem with stimulants actually had severity of dependence scores indicative of stimulant dependence. So there's therefore a need for low threshold interventions that encourage awareness of problems related to MA use and promote treatment seeking. Delivery of such an intervention early in the trajectory of MA use could potentially change treatment seeking behavior and shorten the gap between problem use and treatment seeking. The ESTRIC app was designed to do just that. Developed by the Stimulant Treatment Programme at St. Vincent's Hospital, Sydney, in consultation with ACON and the Albion Centre, the ESTRIC app is a low threshold, early intervention, mobile health resource for people who use MA. It was designed in accordance with the eHealth Behaviour Management Model, and it enables informed self-assessment of risks and harms associated with relative MA use through the completion of a number of self-assessment tools. The app provides relevant up-to-date information and resources about MA use, a tool to track use and health impacts of methamphetamine over time, and referral where appropriate to services and further support based on the results of the self-assessments. The study itself was a randomized 28-day waitlist controlled trial with follow-up to day 56. Consenting adults residing in Australia who reported using MA at least once in the last month were eligible to download the app free of charge from Android or iOS app stores. Those randomized to the intervention arm were able to use the s app immediately, whilst those in the control arm were waitlisted for 28 days before gaining access to the app where they received this, this image here. The primary objectives were to assess the 28-day effectiveness of the s app compared to waitlist control to motivate behavioral change and help seeking among people who use MA regularly and to assess predictors of app usage, defined as duration in the app, by age, gender, sexual orientation, education, duration, and frequency of MA use, and previous or current treatment participation over 28 and 56 days. Secondary objectives included assessing the most commonly used features of the app, the relationship between help seeking, readiness to change, MA use, and time spent engaged in the app, and participant experiences of using the app. Actual and anticipated help seeking were measured by the actual and general help seeking questionnaires. A logistic regression model was used to compare the odds of actual help seeking at day 28 between the intervention and control arms and association between app use and use of MA. And qualitative feedback was collected through one-on-one -on -one semi-structured telephone interviews after 28 days of app use. So we recruited 259 participants, 84 were retained to day 28 and 43 were retained to day 56. There was no significant difference observed between the two groups. 51% of those recruited to the study were gay men, although this is potentially a reflection of our recruitment strategy and engagement with health service partners who serve these communities. Gay men also spent more time engaged with the app compared to all other participants. 61% of participants recruited to the study hadn't previously sought treatment for MA use, and of those retained to day 28, 70% had never sought treatment. This suggests that the app was appealing particularly for those who are treatment naive. 64% of participants retained in the study reported a history of MA, injecting MA, and participants who had higher MA use engaged more with the app. Amongst those randomized to immediate app access, those who were treatment seeking at baseline were more likely to engage with the app, perhaps because the app in itself was providing an alternate source of help. The study demonstrated that the app was effective in promoting help seeking among people who use MA. At day 28, 46% of participants in the intervention group had sought professional help, compared to 24% of those in the control group. Importantly, participants in the intervention group who were not help seeking at baseline were 8% more likely to seek professional help at day 28 for every additional minute engaged with the app. We suggest that the app may have facilitated participants along the motivational pathway and that the provision of an on-demand resource to locate where and how to seek help may have contributed to a participant's capacity to seek help. In the intervention group at day 28, a 10 minute increase in app engagement time was associated with a decrease in days of MA use by 0.4 days. 
And from the 25 interviews, help seeking as prompted by the app was coded four times and behavior change was coded seven times as participants became more aware of the reality of their stimulant use. So the ESTRA cap was shown to be a feasible, low resource, self-administered intervention for adults in Australia who use MA. This study demonstrates the effectiveness of the ESTRA cap in motivating professional help seeking, particularly among treatment naive populations. Using supportive self-monitoring, the app assists people who use MA to identify problem use and promotes treatment seeking. As an early intervention, the SCHEC app has the potential to facilitate the first step in a stepped care approach to treatment, reducing treatment delays and avoiding more serious adverse health outcomes. App functionality was an issue, identified through qualitative feedback and from our own experiences, and use of third party services and technology platforms posed some challenges that will need to be considered in future work. However, with around 50,000 people dependent on MA in Australia, Novel interventions such as this provide promising means to increase treatment coverage. Future directions include implementing the app as part of a stepped care approach to clinical treatment within a range of clinical settings. Primary care and sexual health service utilisation is high among people who use MA, but opportunities to intervene are often missed, and future research will include trialling the implementation of the app within these settings. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that. Fantastic. So maybe we just will quickly bring everyone up um, for a couple of questions, if we can, Gemma. All right. Thanks for that. Um, now, Nadine, jump in and um, squash it anytime you need to, because I'm aware that we're just a touch over time. But maybe we might um, just try and get a couple of these questions out in the box. And I'd just like to say thanks for everyone who just presented. It was pretty interesting for me, highly re relevant to a lot of the things that I care about in particular. Um, so the first one is from Susie um, for Antonio. Very exciting to see COGREM being folded into methamphetamine care, wondering whether you are aware of the implementation of COGREM 10 specialist AOD Resi Rehabs in New South Wales, will collaboration be possible in terms of sharing results, outcomes, and growing evidence base for these approaches? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Susie, for, for the question. Yes, I, I know about it, but I would like to know more. I mean, I, I've been uh, talking to, I think um, it is, um, the program is connected with uh, Dr. Jamie Berry, if I'm correct, and I've been chatting with him and uh, we're actually collaborating in a number of uh, international initiatives to try to uh, reach a consensus on the best approaches for cognitive remediation in the context of uh, addiction. And uh, I'm super excited just knowing that, uh, that that has been implemented across 10 different treatment services in New South Wales. So I would love to, to share experiences and outcomes. Actually, I think I have, uh, we have in the trial similar outcome measures to the ones that you were using as well. Uh, so yeah, anytime. Fantastic. Um, and the next one is just from Courtney, uh, I believe for Florence, uh, is there plausibility of sending public health messaging like early warning systems of novel drugs via apps like SCheck app, particularly as it seems to target people who are not currently accessing treatment services. I, I was thinking the same thing as you were talking as well. I might hand this one over to Nadine, if that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, look, that's a really, really, really great question. I mean, the the inter integration of different um, online systems is something that 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 we could look at going forward. And I think that's a great question about the S Check app, as we think about how to better get it out there and and um, redesign it so it's a, an accessible. Um, intervention and if people would I assume it would have to be an opt-in kind of thing that people might want or not want I know that in our in in our trial some people actually commented that they didn't like having push notifications when they were trying not to use because it was reminding them that they were trying not to use so it would have to be a, an opt-in opt basis and and the way that that's delivered would would need more more research and I think this is where this ties into to the work that Monica and Susie and Rita were presenting before um, and that 
Penny's going to be embarking on with the Prompt Response Network is really trying to understand what kind of means of communicating alerts are, are going to be acceptable and desired by people who use drugs, because I think we're going to need a multitude of different routes. So some social media, some opt-in, some opt-out um, and targeting in different ways. So we need, we are, that, that qualitative work actually is still, still pending and I know Penny's embarking on some of that work as well. Fantastic. And just if I can sneak a quick one in um, for uh, Alison, um, it just, it's probably in the details, maybe reflective of the stuff that we see in drug use overall. But um, I just wanted to know if there's any indication from the evidence that you collected um, why attendance might be lower with, with females. Just I've been talking lately to some of my female friends who use drugs Mm -hmm. Now talking about struggling to relate and things like that. So I was just interested when you presented that. Yeah, I suspect in part it's due to your kind of broader issues um, in lower presentations of females. But one thing um, was around accessibility and confidentiality and um, uh, anonymity. And so we did a related project, not uh, um, not NCAD funded, but we looked at um, online versus face-to-face -face use of smart recovery. Um, and oftentimes people um, who identified as female tended to enjoy the online space a bit better than the face-to-face -face space because it, it felt safer, it felt less confrontational. Um, kind of felt easier from a practical perspective as well if people were trying to juggle looking after the kids and getting dinner ready and all of the other bits and bobs that happens with regular life being able to zoom into an online meeting sort of felt a bit more convenient so I su suspect that there's a range of issues that play into it but they're some of the ones that come to mind right now yeah that's an interesting point for people just, in my space yeah. yeah and I just want to add that we we actually are looking at some data that was collected as part of a, a research project at St Vincent's looking asking people who identified as women about um, barriers to accessing treatment because I think traditionally the way we've designed treatment services have been around the idea of a male sub person who uses drugs and there's a whole range of conceptualizations around what treatment is and what the place of treatment is that are perhaps gendered that we don't even really notice so it's beyond the ideas of reproductive health or beyond the ideas of kind of the social role of being a woman but more more fundamental uh, gendered ways of viewing treatment and treatment needs and treatment delivery uh, and so we're just working through some of that now but I think that's a bigger program of work that we collectively need to do we know that that at now in Australia there's kind of gender parity around substance use uh, methamphetamine use so we, we really do need to be making sure we have uh, a whole gender lens on what we're doing um, and and not just for people who identify as women but just actually looking at gender and gender identification and and gender diversity within our, our populations as well thanks hey thanks we'll, we'll probably finish it there not to hold everyone back too long but appreciate the last session brought it home strong and i'll hand it back to nadine you. Thank you, Jack, for chairing and thank you um, to our presenters. It's pretty exciting to, to see a whole range of, of interventions that are, that are being developed and moving really away from manualised CBT, which has its place, but that we, it's great to have kind of a, a whole range of options for treatment. So we've, been, we've explored um, a range of, of psychosocial interventions. We've looked also at a range earlier on of, of ways of detecting and responding to emerging drugs of concern. And then this morning we covered through covered uh, new directions in, in pharmacotherapies. And I, I think no one's suggesting that each one of these things on their own will be the sol a solution for reducing harms related to methamphetamine and other drugs. But if we build a whole system that, in that includes many of these new innovations, I think we will get a long way further in addressing problems in the community related to the use of substances and also um, promoting healthier lifestyles in, in the community. Just like to thank wholeheartedly everybody for sticking with us today and, and sitting in on this presentation today. I really hope next year we'll be able to get to do this face to face. It'd be lovely to, to see people and interact. I mean, some of the, we, we're getting really, I think we're getting a lot better at interacting online, but it'd be great to see people face to face next year. So thank you very much.